Hello, Dr. Mike here. This is for my cybersecurity version 2 series and this topic is on uh, topic 9 uh, which actually is two topics. This video is going to be on wireless and it covers chapter 3 in our new textbook. Chapter 3 covers wireless and IDS. I'm going to do IDS in a separate video. So um, the chapter itself just covers really the standards and Get, just understanding your wireless itself is very important and it's the types of attacks you might see. Um, really, the network security of wireless does not change too much from any other network security. So, uh, hence, are you using proper sub, sub, subnetting, um, firewalls, for example. So, uh, example, we want to have a visitor network that's only available um, with a temporary using a password for each individual visitor that maybe is produced from someone who has an authorized account within the company. Uh, so maybe a, a one week visitor, tech name password for a certain visitor that's emailed to them. And then that subnet they attach to is only uh, has ports 80 and 443 open, so only web traffic. Maybe you have another one separate uh, that has a separate zone separate subnet that might have deeper reach, so maybe for engineers. Uh, they may have port maybe 22 open you know, for SSH. So. Uh, it's, and it's, it's a lot more work to administer this and set up, but it is great because you don't want to have one big Wi-Fi network that everyone can connect to, that visitors can connect to. And you can see the problems here. And this goes, again, this really is a network issue just in general, network um, architecture. So, but there's some stuff about um, Wi-Fi, of course, you have to keep into account. And of course, is there's no wires. So someone could be in the parking lot uh, to connect to our network. Does it need to be transmitting that far? Um, capacity and performance, is this going to be some issues for internal employees, for all their laptops moving around? Uh, because availability is part of that. And so um, the chapter covers this. This is chapter three in our new textbook. Uh, and it ends up here to talk about NetStumbler. Uh, there's a lot of different stuff here. So since not much has changed, I'm going to bring in my previous video. I talk about wireless attacks. Uh, it's from a different textbook, different chapter, but the concepts are the same. So I will cut to this video and you can watch this um, in its entirety. Again, wireless security being Wi-Fi, but also not just Wi-Fi. Think of things like Bluetooth, NFC, RF attacks, um, of course, and local Wi-Fi being the biggest one. And Wi-Fi should be an extension of your network security because um, this goes back to previous chapters talked about. You build your network, right? You might have your um, isolated, you know, your data center core. Even inside there, you might have, uh, should have separate isolation for really sensitive stuff. So our core network here, uh, possibly a management network. And then from that, we might have, you know, your office network. And then the Wi-Fi is going to sort of live out here. And this is where you get the most risk, especially if you have a, like a visitor's network, maybe a Wi-Fi network uh, for visitors, uh, hopefully. Um, and that should be controlled and only allowed access maybe from within the office Wi-Fi network. Uh, it should be controlled access as in probably a good uh, resolution would be uh, an internal employee needs to log in and authenticate with their credentials to set up either a one day or X day, one to X day, maybe max 30 days. Um, user ID and password, that's unique. That only gives um, that user login to this network. And then this should be really locked down, maybe like ports 443 and port 80, maybe other ports, uh, maybe exceptions can be made for that. And you need to think about because you're gonna have people coming here, it could be vendors. And they're going to need to access possibly FTP, um, SSH, or other services to support their job being within the company. So you got to be able to be flexible for those type of things. But you got to be really stringent about auditing and control. And the biggest thing is going to be just not giving straight access. You know, this isn't a coffee shop. You don't walk in and see the password is good coffee on the chalkboard, and suddenly you're on the same exact network with everyone else. So. That isolation is going to be very important. When it comes to NFC attacks, Bluetooth attacks, that really is mobile um, and mobile device security. I'm going to leave it at that. You should really 
consider that as part of your overall security strategy. Uh, specifically, comes out laptops, flat tablets, and mobile devices such as phones, especially ones that are issued by the company. But even more, you also might have ones where you have apps that give access to company data, but can be loaded onto a private device. So, uh, look at the risk for NFC and Bluetooth. Could be pretty low. I don't want to put off NFC being a don't worry about it. And same with Bluetooth, there are attacks, but the uh, attack vectors are very narrow, and the impact it could also be very narrow. Now, it could be the user has a company phone. It gets uh, some sort of Bluetooth attack, and they get uh, contact from it. And we know from any kind of pen testing, um, any type of internal information, email addresses and contacts, can be handy for later on attacks, especially for spear phishing and social engineering. So um, again, understand the attack vectors here with Bluetooth. I'm going to go over those. Um, NFC attacks, data theft, uh, man in the middle. I think the biggest attack you got for this is uh, the man in the middle is uh, someone putting up almost like a skimmer, um, uh, possibly skimming off NFC information um, somewhere inside there. But you know, I'm not saying there's not a lot of attacks like that. There probably are some. In the sense of enterprise security, though, something to consider. And this goes back to your mobile device strategy. So um, RFID tags, things like this. Um, can be subject to attacks, but let's gonna move on from that. Uh, fake tags are the one thing. Uh, if you have some sort of security in place for use RFID tags, either to allow access, those tags can be um, recorded and spoofed. Um, key fobs for entry, how they how they set up. So we'll get into the physical aspect now. Uh, so really it comes down to your Wi-Fi, your WLAN. Um, there are have been histories. There have been recent uh, vulnerabilities found, like the uh, the key, zero key insertion attack uh, for the latest W um, Wi-Fi standard. Again, uh, as with any current attack, understand all the, the details. Don't go off the news and uh, oh my God, all Wi-Fi is hackable now. Well, look at the the, at the attack vector. What it takes for the attack to happen? Um, and then go back and look at your actual setup and see if there's any risks there. And if so, how can you mitigate it? Um, but that just goes along with this, this chapter here, really goes into more of a review. Uh, understand some of the attack again, evil twins, rogue access points. That's probably the one. Uh, and this would be the one that really comes from internal. Um, so, you, again, we have our office here set up, uh, we have our data center. And then we have maybe a smaller ring around the data center management, maybe a DevOps ring, uh, pretty tightly, still tightly held. Then we have a regular office. Um, let's call this DevOps. And then a uh, regular office, right? Management, front desk, things like that. Uh, and of course, you would have your uh, DMZ. And this, of course, goes out to the net internet. But when you look at it again, is someone in here? Um, maybe doesn't like the idea of using the Wi-Fi, and they set their own rogue access point. So a lot of times the rogue access point is not an external attacker, it's someone setting up an internal access. Uh, let's make a little Wi-Fi router here. They set up in their office because they want to do some stuff with, with, within this local office area. And it's a small footprint, but it does leak externally. It physically gets outside into the parking lot area. Uh, someone out here could pick that up and then find out this is actually insecurely connected to an internal desktop. This becomes an attack, uh, a great internal attack vector, and someone gets their foot their foothold in that direction, and then they can work their way in. So, rogue access points, uh, evil twins definitely can happen, uh, but mostly this is going to occur from again not malicious in nature, just someone not following the rules. So, um, doing. An actual Wi-Fi audit is very important, and to find those access points that are running that are not, uh, you know, authorized. Now, someone can take on your Wi-Fi with denial of service and so on. You can drop packets. Um, there can be some, some disruption, so keep that in mind. I'm not going to go with that. We've talked about this already. Intercepting Wi-Fi signals definitely one. 
Um, you want to have secure Wi-Fi in place. So understanding your Wi-Fi infrastructure is very important. Um, replay attacks or hijacking, um, there are ways around that, but you want to make sure you set up ways for this. Um, spoofing, jamming, again, that's for general service. And this goes back into understanding what you're running. So if you're running old uh, web based <laughs> security, so again, maybe you might come on as a brand new cybersecurity uh, engineer, infosec officer, whatever you want to call your title. Um, your job is internal security, it might be for network security. And part of your audit should be not just uh, is our you know, do we have there's no rogue access points, but also our, our actual access points internally are they running the latest and greatest um, encryption? So, uh, and someone maybe had left behind an older access point that's still official, but it's running web. So that should be seen in an audit and definitely taken care of as it could be broken. Um, it comes a weak leak in the armor. Again, there's some methods here how to connect. I'm going to go over those. Um, media access controls. You could do MAC address filtering. This is not really good um, security. It's pretty weak security. It's more of a layered security. Maybe I have an internal access point. Um, maybe for the data center, there is a access point that I have only arranged within a data center and maybe leaks out into the DevOps area, right? I should not erase my stuff. <laughs> Um, so maybe you need that. Maybe you need to have Wi-Fi within a data center. Um, you could employ a few things. One, of course, is do not um, broadcast out the SSID. Uh, so no, no broadcasting SSID. And then also have MAC address filtering. Maybe you have um, specific tablets or laptops that are allowed within a data center that are maybe not, can't even physically leave it. Maybe they checked out from the entry room or checked out just at the very security entry post there. And those are official. They have, their MAC addresses are recorded as only things can be on this data, this network. So they must be really high and secure. On top of that, I would also add in authentication, um, maybe using single sign-on or using some sort of authentication for internal, um, so it did not just say random password or a generic password. No, there's no chalkboard outside of the data center saying the today's password is, you know, good coffee. <laughs> so uh, tightly secured access of this um, if it is needed. And then again, this, and this access point maybe only has uh, actual, the network itself can only access, is subnetted for the data center. So um, it is that bleed over you got to think about too. So device access, because the devices are going to be movable. They're not plugged in um, and the bleed over that network. So again, MAC address filtering is not the best. It is a layered security measure. Um, if someone's attacking, it could see the MAC addresses right over the, uh, just capture the network traffic and then spoof their network address, MAC address. So SSID again, you can broadcast that, not broadcast that. Um, and you want to limit exposure, which is possible. Uh, WPA. Um, there's a personal and an enterprise level. Uh, know about how it works and how the connections work and the chapter toes into this and how the, uh, you know, the uh, temporal key integrity protocol works and so on, methods integrity checking. Um, again, Wi-Fi is built on the fact that someone's going to drop and come back on. And it's gonna be able to handle that. And that's where that zero key insertion attack happened during the five-way handshake so you can always look into that. Um, but understanding how it works is gonna help you understand not just um, its architecture, you know, where is it spread out to? Where, you know, where's our signal going out to? Um, how is it secure? Is it, you know, doing the uh, authentication over, um, again, maybe a temporary authentication that's set from someone internal that's been authenticated with their internal credentials and so on. But also just how does the connections work? So when we do see that article, it comes up and says, hey, there's a, a brand new um, you know, WPA attack that happens uh, during the five-way handshake. You can sort of figure out how it fits within the, um, your, your sort of realm and how the risk is. So uh, pre-shared keys, I'm go to WPA on vulnerabilities. Um, again, 
WPA2 is what we currently at the time of this recording to. I think three's on the board. We have the latest and greatest. Again, this is not anything that's any surprise if you come on off our chapters about encryption. Um, this is in the same line of that. Um, when you evaluate all your encryptions, you use the different parts of your um, infrastructure, you know, database encryptions, TLS encryptions on servers, also what kind of encryptions are we using, we're using the latest protections on our Wi-Fi. So uh, WPA2, just understand that there are ways you can control this. Um, a lot of times in, in this outer office here, there will be, you know, Wi-Fi access points. And this could be also, let's say, the college. You know, we're here at the college, and the classrooms and the hallways have these access points. And, you know, and they're there so when someone walks in from the entryway and goes into a classroom here, and they go down to a classroom here, they have always have always on connection. And you don't want someone to have to sign in. You don't want this device to be have names and passwords. And then, of course, if someone goes from here, they got to sign in again. You don't want that. So it's inconvenient for the user. Having those names and passwords out here is definitely bad, or any kind of information out here is bad. So usually enterprise setup, um, there is some a central server that this all goes into. It'll probably be somewhere here in the DevOps area, let's say. These all report in, and our their database of authentication credentials are held internal. So these are basically just smarter antennas that are out here that are hardwired connected to a central source. So enterprise is a little different at home. You know, when you come home, you have Wi-Fi. Um, you already have a passcode, either you made one or it came with your device. And you put it into your device once, you walk around your house, you're good. Uh, but when it comes to a larger scale enterprise, you got to um, handle this, this type of scaling. And this is a lot more scalable of a uh, way to do it. So here you can see the handshaking authentication. Uh, we're not going to go ahead and uh, go over that. Eight, but understand the eight, uh, IEEE is the process, AO2. 2.1x, 2.11 typically is heard of. Um, authentication protocols, how can authentication can happen? Again, rogue access points, um, peripheral uh, protection, things like that. And your access point configuration settings, that's where that comes in right there. Our access points, how they how they handle. So, so anyways, a uh, resource you can use, uh, things you can look at, for example, SANS. And SANS has uh, great resources, white papers and so on. They actually have checklists. So I just Google SANS checklists. And you have enterprise wireless checklist here. So you have to use this, you know, verbatim, but you can take this and pick it apart and make a little quick spreadsheet. And you have, now you have, excuse me, um, both here a question list. Has the overall architecture enterprise will end up as a deployment, blah, blah, blah. You can go through this and answer yes or no to these questions. And what you don't know, you can go find out. So it's configuration management in place. Um, if not, that comes a red flag. So again, you don't have to come to this with a blank page. You have these great resources like SANS um, to help you, you know, audit your, your, uh, your enterprise or your, your, your larger sort of enterprise level network. So default passwords have been changed. That's always a big one. Don't always have default passwords that come with the devices. Configurations, they're also backed up too if it's not on here. You don't want your Wi-Fi to go down and then you have to re-image your access um, points and finally you gotta re reset them up again. So um, SSID construction and so on. So this is a great asset here. Again, um, I will Google SANS, uh, checklists, SANS checklist, and there's actually a bunch here. Check it out, there's stuff here for, you know, step-by-step -step guides. Um, this one is the enterprise wireless one, so. Uh, fantastic resource, and there's probably others out there too. Uh, NIST probably has some stuff, and if you're dealing with things like, um, you know, government, PCI, there might be some, um, there's more out there to help you along the way with dealing with wire security.